Okay, we go to the full view. Okay. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, invasive ventilation modes, mainly focusing on volume guarantee, high frequency oscillatory ventilation, and inhaled nitric oxide in babies receiving SIMB or synchronized IMB. So conflicts of interest, as many of you know, I am inventor of the RAM nasal cannula. I have a patent. I'm also has a patent on a new low cost ventilator. Hopefully it will become available to everybody soon. If I get any honorarium, I donate to a charity. And I will, I typically don't teach how to intubate babies. I only teach how to extubate babies. Is my translation uh, happening simultaneously or? The presentation is in English and it is supposed that everybody understands English. Ah, and, okay. And will uh, uh, formulate uh, questions also in English. So okay. I can uh, introduce every question to you. Okay. And if there are other questions that remain unanswered uh, immediately, I okay. would ask you to answer them in writing after the webinar. Okay, yeah, so they can put that question on the chat box so I can exactly. see on the chat yes. box too. For okay. Q and A, yes. Okay, thank you. so thank, thank you. So my objective saw today to briefly talk about pressure versus volume control mode of ventilation and then discuss the risks and benefits of synchronized versus non-synchronized and then high frequency oscillatory ventilation in preterm babies with RDS and finally, inhaled nitric oxide is increasingly being used in preterm babies without much evidence but uh, there are including me we use nitric oxide in preterm babies and i will show you what the studies and what everybody is doing around the world so when we talk about invasive mechanical ventilation you can either control the pressure or you can control the volume so for example, uh, I'll show you the difference between the two. Then we'll talk about SIMB or assist control. There is not much difference in terms of the outcome between SIMB and assist control. So if you are used to assist control, uh, you can uh, use assist control. Uh, if you are not, if you are comfortable with SIMB, you can use SIMB. There is really no difference between the two modes. Uh, pressure support ventilation in babies with spontaneously is a very good idea. So whenever baby is intubated on CPAP, you should provide pressure support at least five to six centimeters above the PEEP or CPAP. We'll talk about high frequency ventilation and then NAVA tomorrow. So basically the major difference between pressure control and volume control is in a pressure limited or pressure controlled mode, the volume is very, you don't have control on the tidal volume. Here is a pressure volume curve on a baby with bad or severe RDS. If your pressure increases, the volume doesn't go up. But if you use a factor, for example, compliance improves, same pressure, you deliver a lot more tidal volume. So, and we know if the amount of gas or tidal volume that gets into the baby's lungs, which causes lung injury or volume trauma. That is why many people are going from pressure control to volume control or volume guarantee mode. But if you don't have the ventilator that can deliver a volume guarantee mode, you can still use pressure control as long as you put a volume limit. You set the alarm volume limit I don't want the baby to get more than six ml per kilo after surfactant therapy. Then it will give you a warning. Then you can go and decrease the PIP. That's an easier way of managing because pressure controlled ventilation is the simplest way to manage lots of babies. Volume guarantee mode needs 
uh, flow sensor, especially at the Y, and adds expense, adds some dead space. That is why a lot of centers, even in the US, are still using pressure control mode as the most common one. For example, in my NICU, pressure control mode is the most common one. We will occasionally use volume guarantee mode, but most of the time we use pressure control mode, as long as you limit the tidal volume along. So you know that you have to decrease the PIP when you give surfactant or a diuretic or steroids and the compliance improves. On the volume control mode, truly, you can see <clears throat> this is the baby with the RDS here. Um, um, RDS here. Uh, after high pressures, you are able to increase the volume. But once you give surfactant, even with the lower pressure, you get a lot more volume. So here, you have no control on the pressure. Okay, you can set a maximum pressure limit. We typically recommend maximum PIP of 30 centimeters. If you're on a volume control mode or volume guarantee mode. Anytime, if the ventilator has to work more than 30 centimeters, you need to know why is that ventilator has used 30 centimeters to deliver five or six ml of tidal volume. Maybe the tube is blocked, maybe there are secretions, maybe the tube went into the right mainstem bronchus, or baby got a pneumothorax, or baby's lung disease got worse. So these are the things that you need to think about. This is in acute babies. In chronic babies, like a baby with BPD, who are using volume control mode, you have to increase the limit of pressure to 40. Some people routinely set the PIP at 50 centimeters, five zero. Because even the PIP is 50, you are controlling the tidal volume and you will not cause volume trauma. But you really need to think about why is the ventilator using so much pressure to deliver that volume, okay? So that's the major difference between pressure control versus volume control or pressure limited or volume limited. They all say mean the same. So again, we know that excessive tidal volume is the one that causes lung injury. Uh, ventilation at low tidal volume also will cause lung injury. So you don't want the lung to be not well expanded. And you can do that by using appropriate P, positive and expiratory pressure, keep the lung open. So lung, if you recruit the lung, it increases functional residual capacity and it protects against atelectatic trauma or trauma from collapse of the lung. So here, the other problem is each ventilator does manage how they deliver differently. So you don't want to have too many ventilators in your NICU, different companies. Stick with one or two ventilator um, companies because each one does a little bit differently and you need to know what, how your machine works. Here is, you know, most of the time, this is the pressure control SIME or volume control SIME, uh, pressure support ventilation, PRVC, pressure regulated volume control, assist control. Again, assist control can be pressure or volume and APRV. Very rarely we use APRV in, in the NICU. It's used often in the PICU. Uh, you really don't need to use APRV in the NICU unless baby has very severe uh, lung disease, severe BPD. Um, this is called airway pressure release ventilation. Not many ventilators offer this mode anyway. Trigger, what's, what sucks the breath? Could be patient or could be time triggered. Most ventilators will time triggering. Limit, what do you limit? You can limit either the pressure or the volume, depending on cycling up. When you switch from inspiration to expiration, it can be time cycled or flow cycled. Flow cycling is the best. If we have a ventilator and that has flow cycling, you should turn it on. So you set an inspiratory time of 0 0.4 seconds, for example. We do 0 0.45, whether it's small baby or big baby, really doesn't matter. Then what we do is flow cycling at 10% of the peak flow. I'll show you later on the graph. So when the peak flow decreases to 10% of the peak value, that means the lung is completely full. There's no reason to keep the valve closed. 
your inspiratory time. So automatically, it opens to exhalation and the baby can breathe out. You really get good synchronization if you flow terminate it. So keep the flow termination minimum 10%. Sometimes you may use 5%, but most of the time, you keep it simple, keep the flow termination at 10% of the peak value. The ventilators will give the option 5%, 10%, 15, 20, 25. Don't go too high. 10% is pretty good. Okay, that's another way of improving synchronization. Flow. How does the gas come out of the ventilator? In a pressure controlled machine, it's a decelerating flow. Flow gradually ramps up. As the lung gets full, the flow decays, called decelerating flow. Whereas on a volume mode, anytime you switch to volume control mode, the flow becomes constant. The ventilator increases the flow, holds it until the duration of inspiratory time, and then decrease the flow back to zero, and then allows the lung to empty. Exhalation stops. Okay. And fortunately, all these modes, spontaneous breathing is allowed. Baby can breathe spontaneously, whether you're an SIME, pressure support, PRVC, assist control, or APRV. Okay. So pressure control is decelerating flow. Volume control is uh, constant flow. But most ventilators nowadays can change the flow pattern to decelerating flow too. Here is a PRVC, for example. You can have a decelerating flow. Uh, some ventilators will give the option. What is the advantage of decelerating flow? Decelerating flow is physiological. When you take a breath in, okay? Constant flow means a high flow rate and it's like blowing a fan in front of the baby or the TT tube. So it causes more turbulence. That's why if you can have a decelerating flow setup, even on a volume control mode, you should set it up. Again, some ventilators <coughs> will allow you to do that, some do not. <coughs> Here is the example of constant or square wave in a volume control mode, flow increases, kept high until the inspiratory time, then comes to zero, flow stops, then babies, this gas is coming out of the baby's lungs. Decelerating flow is, <clears throat> flow starts early, as the lung is getting full, flow comes down slowly, and then because your PIP is reached, right? And then this is the gas coming out of the baby. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sinusoidal flow is here. This is mostly spontaneous breathing. Gradual increase in flow. This is inspiratory flow. This is expiratory flow coming from the baby. Again, if you look at the tracings, pressure tracing, this is a peak inspiratory pressure, servo control. This is a pressure control mode. Okay, PIP goes up, and then you put an alarm, generally three to five centimeters. Uh, uh, about the baby's PIP that you want. PIP limit, you can see that the inspiratory flow, expiratory flow, inspiratory flow, expiratory flow. So deliver tidal volume depends on the peak inspiratory pressure, compliance of the tubing, baby's compliance, and patient effort. I'll show you in a few minutes. Here is the volume control mode where the pressure slowly increases as the volume goes into the lock. And then at the end of inspiration, this is peep here, and gas comes out of the baby. So constant flow, decelerating flow. Pressure tracing will look like this in a pressure control mode, like this, whereas in a volume control mode, pressure ramps up and then comes down. Again, this is an adult ventilator, volume, they call it volume cycled mode volume control, adults do volume cycle, call it. It's basically, this is the ventilator. Tidal volume is measured either here or here. In adults, they usually measure here, but then it's not accurate for us because the tubing compliance is high. When the ventilator delivers the flow, it may not reach the baby. And if the baby has stiff lungs, baby won't get this gas. Most of the gas will be in the circuit. That is why we use a smaller circuit more less compliant circuit, so all the gas and pressure goes to the baby. So to know how much actually going out into the baby, you should put a flow sensor here. Whereas in adults, they use it in the ventilator flow sensor. 
So peak inspiratory pressure leads to compressible volume loss, which means when you compress the gas to a small tube and the gas expands, you don't get that gas going into the baby. You're basically increasing your dead space. And if there are ET tube leaks, then baby also won't get it. And unfortunately in babies, we don't like to use cuffed endotracheal tubes because the risk of causing damage to the trachea and compliance to the respiratory system. As I mentioned, lung is stiff, baby may not get the pressure. So, so basically, what is a volume controlled ventilation mode? It is a pressure controlled mode of ventilation with automatic adjustment of the PIP to target a set tidal volume that's set by you at the airway opening, not at the ventilator, but at the airway opening. Again, just like in the pressure control mode, many ventilators operate differently. You need to know, uh, I asked um, Ursula to tell me what are the ventilators you commonly use in, in Romania. And there are a number of you who have seen Draeger, Leoni Plus, Maquette, so servo I. So you need to know again your machine. So each one does it differently. Here is a pair cup, they measure at the endotracheal tube or at the ventilator. Draeger measures only at the endotracheal tube, Draeger and VN500, because they calculate um, based on the amount of gas going in and coming out, they calculate and estimate the tidal volume. So in their volume guarantee mode, okay. Layani Plus only measures at the endotracheal tube and you can deliver volume guarantee mode or volume limited mode. And I'll show you what is the difference between volume guarantee versus volume limit or volume control. Here, adjust the PIP to limit the exhale tidal volume. So they use exhale tidal volume. Bear Cub uses inhale the inspiratory tidal volume. Max Servo 300 is flow cycle and with PIP adjustment and inspiratory tidal volume. So you really want to, if you truly want to use volume guarantee mode or volume control mode, you should adjust your exhale tidal volume, not inhale tidal volume. Because inspiratory tidal volume really doesn't get into the baby. There's some leaks around the endotracheal tube, only if it's 30%, you get 30% less tidal volume delivered. So what is coming out of the baby's lungs through the endotracheal tube is the best way to target your tidal volume. If you're going to set five ml per kilo, five ml per kilo of exhale tidal volume is the best way to manage babies on volume guarantee mode. Most, you know, the Drager says they can work up to 90% leak. But most of the time, if it is more than 40 or 50% leak, the ventilator doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So you need to either increase the size of the endotracheal tube or switch your mode to pressure control. Here is SLE 5000, it's a hybrid mode. They measure at the endotracheal tube, adjust the inspiratory time to limit the inspiratory volume. Stefani, exhale tidal volume. VIP bird, it's a hybrid mode. Viasis at the endotracheal tube. So again, as I mentioned, each ventilator does it differently. So know how your ventilator does volume control mode or volume guarantee mode. That way you really are helping the babies and delivering what you think. So here is the major confusion. Sometimes people get confused. What is different between volume control mode or volume targeted mode and volume guarantee mode? This is the most important slide I want you to remember. Volume control mode, you control the inspiratory tidal volume. Volume guarantee mode, you control the expiratory tidal volume coming out of the baby. Flow sensor, you don't have to have one at the Y, at the, between the endotracheal tube and the circuit, whereas volume guarantee mode, you have to have one at the Y. Volume, tidal volume delivery, same as set tidal volume for every breath in volume control mode, whereas in volume guarantee mode, the pressure is adjusted to get closer to the tidal volume you dialed in. So every breath doesn't get exactly the same tidal volume. But depending on the leaks, the ventilator will adjust the PIP by three to five centimeters to target the tidal volume that you ordered 
based on the previous breath. Default flow pattern, <coughs> constant flow, except in the PRVC mode, here is decelerating flow. I told you decelerating flow is better. Volume guarantee mode, not available here, available in pressure control or TCPL mode. Time cycle, pressure limited plus VG. Assist control plus VG. Pressure limit, you set by the user. Here, you don't have to have set the P, P, you just set the P max of 30, and then the ventilator will, once it reaches 27, it'll give you an alarm. If it's at 35, it'll alarm when the ventilator has to use 32 centimeters. PIP, usually higher peak pressures are required, but the flow is constant, whereas here you can deliver the same tidal volume using lower PIP. So that's the advantage of volume guarantee mode. So again, <clears throat> in summary, volume guarantee mode is nothing but a pressure limited, continuous flow of gas going through with targeting the exhale tidal volume. And volume guarantee mode does require use of a flow sensor at the wire. Here is how the ventilator adjusts it, whether it's VG or PRVC. Ventilator delivers a breath and then measures the tidal volume, compares it to what you dialed in. If it is more than the next breath, it decreases the PIP. If it is less than what you set in, it will increase the PIP by three centimeters for each breath. So it's constantly adjusting to target the tidal volume you dialed in, you wanted the baby to get. That's what BG does, that's what PRVC does. Here is another slide. So uh, maximum pressure it will go is three centimeters above. And again, not the inspiratory volume, expiratory tidal volume. This is expiratory flow and expiratory flow is integrated to exhale tidal volume. So it measures the exhale tidal volume that you set in, ventilator will automatically adjust the PIP, both in PRVC and in the VG mode. What are the benefits? You can deliver a, a relatively constant tidal volume. Not exactly what you dialed in, that's going to be variable because the ventilator is constantly looking and making the adjustment of the tidal volume. Minimize the episodes of hypocapnia, over ventilation, doesn't happen. And doesn't cause over distension. As the lung compliance changes, for example, post surfactant, it automatically decreases the peak inspiratory pressure so that the same tidal volume is maintained. Weaning of pressure happens in real time, so you don't have to worry about weaning the PIP constantly and compensates for base various respiratory effort. If the baby is having periodic breathing or shallow respiration, it will still deliver the tidal volume that you dialed in. So these are the benefits of volume guarantee mode. Having this is a, again servo I, you can uh, on biases, or servo biases ventilator. Um, here is the tidal volume you set it four ml per kilo, and this is before this is the tidal volume um, axis here in a volume guarantee mode. This is the PIP. As you can see, after surfactant, before surfactant, the ventilator was using about 18 centimeters of PIP, peak inspiratory pressure. Once surfactant is given, lung compliance improved, ventilator automatically decreased the PIP. Now it's using 13 centimeters of PIP to deliver the same tidal volume, around the same tidal volume, four ml per kilo or 4.5, 4 ml per kilo. So that is the how ventilator works with the volume guarantee mode. And you can set it up either in the pressure control, VG, or assist control plus VG mode. You can do both. There are subtle differences between the two. You, what's the best mode? We use uh, TCPL plus VG. But if you're used to assist control, you can use assist control plus VG. There's no difference in terms of outcomes. Limitations, as I mentioned, if the leak is more than 40 or 60%, it's really not reliable. 
because the ventilator has a hard time measuring the tidal volume. And pressure adjustments occur over a few breaths to deliver the set tidal volume. So if you set a lower rate on the ventilator, it may not work. So the typically in a volume guarantee mode, set your respiratory rate at 30, okay? Not below that, and you don't need a higher rate. And volume guarantee, of course, will work only if the patient is breathing spontaneously. If the baby is apneic, baby is going to get the backup rate. If the baby is sedated, paralyzed, volume guarantee doesn't work because it has to be triggered by the baby. So you need to remember all that. Post-op, uh, you sedated the baby heavily or paralyzed the baby for whatever reason, then volume guarantee doesn't work. That's why you need to set up a backup rate. What are the data? Uh, here are the 16 studies, about 1,000 babies comparing volume target or volume guarantee versus pressure control and showed death or BPD at 36 weeks was not different, but BPD alone at 36 weeks post-menstrual age was lower by about 27%. Number needed to treat, eight babies. Pneumothorax, less, 50% less pneumothorax on volume targeted or volume guarantee mode. Days on mechanical ventilation was not different. Hypocarbia or IBH or periventricular leukomalacia, they were all much lower. So volume control or volume guarantee mode has been shown to have better outcomes in terms of reducing BPD, IBH, pneumothorax, and minimizing hypocarbia. Hypocarbia means low carbon dioxide, which will decrease your cerebral blood flow and can cause ischemic injury to the brain. So if you have it, use it. If we don't have it, it's really not a bad thing. Because as I said, in my unit, most babies are on pressure control mode, but I volume limit the baby. So what do you set? How do you set volume G, VG mode? Again, you can use either pressure AC, assist control, or TCPL, or SIME, any one of the more backup modes, and then add plus VG. Tidal volume, generally about five ml per kilo, that I will show you in another slide, depending on if the baby is RBS or BPD. PIP, 20% above PIP needed to deliver the set tidal volume. So in general, they ask you to set a Pmax. Set the Pmax at 30 centimeters, maximum PIP, pressure that ventilator has to use. That's called the Pmax. P, five or six, inspiratory time, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 seconds, I normally like to use 0 0.4 seconds. Rate, 30 to 40. As I said, in small micro preemies, you may set 40, but in bigger babies, you may set 30. And flow rate, is generally three or four times the size of the endotracheal tube. So if you have a, if you have a 3.0 endotracheal tube, set the flow rate about 10 liters per minute. Again, volume VG mode is a pressure limited, continuous flow, ventilation with targeting the tidal volume. Things, what about in AVIA? In AVIA, ventilator, flow rate has no effect on your inspiratory time unless you, you flow cycle it. Again, you can only flow cycle in the TCPL mode. See, these are some of the things you need to know. That's why I don't like to use too many ventilators because I have to remember each one, how it works. Just stick with one ventilator to deliver VG mode or even TCPL mode, okay? VG is a volume guarantee, is adjusted breath by breath with pressure within three centimeters of the maximum pressure you set in. Pressure SAME or pressure assist control plus VG mode is time cycled and no flow cycling. So if you want flow cycling, you need to put it in the TCPL plus VG mode. Okay, that is why I use TCPL plus VG mode in my unit. But there's nothing wrong using SIME or AC, pressure AC, combined with VG mode. If VG fails for whatever reason, the default mode would be SIME or pressure assist control.
So here is the guidelines proposed by um, Klingenberg from uh, uh, Norway. Um, if a baby has RBS and the baby's weight is less than one kilo, you start at five ml per kilo tidal volume. Maximum pressure is PIP of 30 for everybody. Inspiratory time, he recommends 0 0.3 because babies with RDS have less compliant lung and therefore you don't need a longer inspiratory time. In babies over one kilo, they actually use a large, smaller tidal volume. Even 0.5 ml makes a difference. So 4.5 ml is recommended to start with. And then high times 0 0.3. If the baby is more than two weeks of age, is already getting lung injury, airway damage, increase in dead space, so you want to use a higher tidal volume, five to eight ml per kilo, and you have to use a longer input time, 0 0.45 seconds. Baby with diaphragmatic hernia, use a smaller tidal volume, four ml per kilo. You may want to use a higher rate, like 50 or even 60 sometimes. You can use high rates in the diaphragmatic hernia baby. If you're going to limit, the tidal volume to least possible four ml per kilo. Again, six to eight liters, depending on the size of the endotracheal tube, ET tube leak, it'll tell you the ventilator, try to keep it below 50%. Again, uh, and Marty Kessler um, wrote a nice uh, review article in 20 in last year. He said, one size does not fit all. So term, Late preterm, but normal lungs. Initial tidal volume is 4 to 4.5 ml per kilo. Initial PIP limited to 18 centimeters. Uh, babies with RDS, again, you have to use a little higher pressure, allow higher pressure. Tidal volume is the same, but allow the machine to use higher pressure. In 700 to 1249 grams, you actually have to use a little higher tidal volume, like 4.5 to 5 ml per kilo. Uh, it's really tiny babies, so 700, less than 700 grams, who are initial setting of the tidal volume could be as high as 6 ml per kilo. Preterm term with BPD, you have to use high tidal volume, 6.5. Term meconium aspiration, 5.5 uh, to 6. Meconium aspiration with complete whiteout chest X-ray. Uh, babies look like RDS or ARDS, then use small tidal volume. You have to allow higher pressure. CDH, we talked about it, and you don't want the PIP to be more than 24. Severe BPD, here, remember this, even in a volume guarantee mode, we talk about volume trauma. In a babies with BPD, you cannot ventilate the baby with six or seven ml per kilo. Sometimes you have to use very large tidal volume, 12 ml per kilo, because of the significantly increased alveolar and anatomical dead space and lower respiratory rate because the time constant is prolonged. Therefore, you want to use rates of 20, not 30, 40, 50. You want to use an I time, for example, 0 0.8, um, a rate of 20. I'm talking about babies with BPD. And if you're using volume control or volume guarantee mode, you may have to use 10 or 12 ml per kilo. So, Tidal volume setting depends on the size of the baby, a postnatal age of the baby, and what disease. Are you treating RDS? Are you treating diaphragmatic hernia? Or are you treating BPD? If you're treating RDS, 4 to 5 ml. If you're treating diaphragmatic hernia, 4 ml. If you're treating BPD, anywhere from 7 to 12 ml per kilo. So unfortunately, you cannot use just one target tidal volume for these three totally different pathophysiology in babies. So uh, Drager, they recommend pressure control, pressure support more with VG, about five, 4.5 to 5 ml per kilo, adapt peak inspiratory pressure to the actual PIP after looking at the ventilator, inspiratory time, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4, uh, I probably use 0 0.4, 30 to 40, Again, trigger sensitivity, each ventilator does it differently. Set it one, which is the most sensitive on the Drager. When do you extubate the baby from volume guarantee mode? When the blood gas are stable and the tidal volume, you read it about four ml per kilo, PIP 
ventilator uses to deliver 4 ml per kilo is around 15 to 18. PPC5, FIO2 is less than 40. You extubate the baby to either CPAP or NIPPV, and then wean baby from NIPPV to CPAP to low flow cannula. And if you're using caffeine, which helps these babies, at least use it until about 34 weeks post menstrual age. Okay, that's about volume guarantee mode or volume targeted mode or volume control mode. Now I'm going to switch gears to synchronized or non-synchronized. I think most of you know, synchronized ventilation is probably the best way to do that. And there are a number of ways you can synchronize, assist control, PRVC, SIME, which most of us use. Again, SIME can be pressure control or SAME can be volume control. Of course, we talked about VG mode, pressure support ventilation in the babies only on CPAP or PEEP. And then you can do volume support, proportional assist ventilation and mandatory minute ventilation. These are all the modes that are used in very, very few centers because there's really not much difference in terms of the outcomes. So only very few ventilators give you mandatory minute ventilation. What does it do? You take the tidal volume, multiply by the rate, and then set it as, I want the baby to get a minimum per minute, let's say five ml tidal volume, rate of 40. So I want the ventilator to deliver 200 ml of minute volume per minute. So what it does, ventilator does is, it continuously checking the tidal volume delivered breath to breath, and then it'll adjust it so that at the end of one minute, baby would have gotten the mandatory minute ventilation that you dialed in. Minute ventilation is tidal volume times frequency. Proportional assist ventilation, it is a, it's a mode where the ventilator will support the baby in proportion to the baby's spontaneous breathing effort. As I said, these are not commonly used, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. So here is a baby with IME breath, okay? This is a ventilator delivered breath, this is baby taking a spontaneous breath, ventilated, spontaneous. Here is baby taking a spontaneous breath, ventilator is not delivering. Here is another breath, here is another one. Um, so it's all over the place. This is ventilator delivered breath, ventilator delivered breath, spontaneous breath, and then before the spontaneous breath ended, ventilator started. So you see a lot of asynchronous breathing in regular IMB mode. But if you switch it to SIME mode, so every time the baby wants to take a breath, it will not every time, every time the ventilator, sings, ventilator knows baby is taking a breath, it will give a breath based on the rate you dialed in. So synchronize intermittent. Intermittently it will synchronize in between the two breaths. Let's say you set a rate of 30. Each breath is two seconds, right? So ventilator delivered a breath, and then before the two second comes, if the baby wants to take a breath in between, he can breathe in between spontaneously. So these are spontaneous breath. These are ventilator synchronized breaths from the ventilator, okay? And here is the ventilator breath, this small breath by the baby, small breath by the baby, a bigger breath by ventilator. So the breath size and tidal volume is variable in SIME compared to, again, flow, ventilator, because the high PIP, it has to use a higher pressure. This is inspiratory tidal volume. This is expiratory tidal volume. Here's inspiratory tidal volume, expiratory tidal volume. Small tidal volume generated by the baby, bigger tidal volume by the machine, okay? And what is this area? This is the dead space. Um, anatomic, which is in the trachea and all that. So baby spontaneous breathing is not very effective because it's able to overcome only little bit. That's why SIME breath will give you a larger tidal volume and you can ventilate the babies. Here is pressure support, with SIME. So here is the SIME breath, big breath. And then this is baby breathing spontaneously, but the ventilator is adding pressure support. Like you added pressure support, you can see now that volume delivered is as good as on a mechanical breath. So this is PIP, this is pressure support value. You set your pressure support one third to 
of the delta pressure. So PIP minus P, let's say 20 over five. The delta pressure is 15, right? You set your pressure support at 10. Generally, you don't want to set less than 10, especially in smaller babies, because the resistance is higher with a small endotracheal tube, okay? So pressure support helps augments baby spontaneous respiratory effort and gets much larger tidal volume. So babies can ventilate easily if you add pressure support. Assist control. So every single breath taken by the baby is assisted by the machine. Okay, here is assist control. The baby is taking a breath, machine gives a breath. Baby is taking a breath, machine is giving a breath. This was not triggered, untriggered, untriggered, spontaneous breathing. So every single breath that exceeds the trigger threshold will be assisted by the baby, by the machine. If the baby did not trigger, then baby is taking its own breath, okay? Because you set your trigger sensitivity too high and don't set your rate too high because some patient efforts are not supported if you set your rate too high. Pressure support, again, you can use a lot of ventilators now to have the graphics bedside on the ventilator. It's really useful to see this. If there is, here is an example, with the pressure support ventilation insufficient to meet the patient demand. Baby wants to take a big breath and you're not giving enough pressure, so baby doesn't get the flow. You can see um, here after increasing the pressure support, breath number one here, flow tracing, which occurs when pressure support ventilation is not sufficient to meet the patient demand. You see like an M shape. You want to avoid that. You want like a inverted V like this. Inspiratory, this is expiratory. Breath two shows resolution after increasing the pressure support level from maybe eight centimeters to 10 centimeters. So this is another way you see whether your pressure support is sufficient, is enough or not, by looking at the waveform, flow waveform on the ventilator. So patient triggered ventilation advantages are releases in larger tidal volume with less work of breathing, improves oxygenation, especially in babies over 27 weeks, shortens the duration of mechanical ventilation, decrease the proportion of babies requiring you know, oxygen or BPD, especially in babies less than one kilo, and decrease the fluctuations in blood pressure produced by asynchronous breathing. So these are some of the advantages of SIMV or patient triggered ventilation. I think most of you, overwhelming majority, unless you are in a small community, remote from Bucharest or somewhere, you may not have a ventilator that can do triggered ventilation. You may still do the IME mode. Most of you, I'm sure, have access to SIME mode. Rise time. This is another question constantly comes up. What is a rise time? Inspiratory rise time or pressure rise time, IRT or PRT. Again, each ventilator does it differently. Okay, unfortunately. So what is IRT? IRT is, is the rate at which the ventilator achieves the pressure control variable. How fast the ventilator reach, makes the ventilator to get the pressure you, you want. This is only operative in pressure control modes. IRT should be left short, shortest possible time to decrease the work of breathing and decrease when patient ventilator asynchrony. So you don't want your rise time to be too long. Okay, short, right, short um, inspiratory rise time. Consider short inspiratory rise time to decrease the rate of inspiratory flow. If the peak airway pressure is high because of high airway resistance, for example, in a baby's BPD, you really want your inspiratory, inspiratory rise time. It's a separate knob, separate control. You want to keep it the shortest rise time. And again, I'll show you what each ventilator. Here is the four examples of five ventilators. All have different way of setting it. Uh, Hamilton says, you know, 50 milliseconds is the, they recommend. Um, but they can, you can go as high as um, 200 milliseconds. You don't want to do that. Servo, they recommend, they have a dial of one to 10 and they say, put it at one. 
since you know Siemens um, 300A. Puritan Bennett, they go from one to hundred. Their recommendation is stay around 50. Pair 1000, they have it from zero to minus nine to plus nine. They say just leave it as zero. Rice time, Puritan, this Puritan man. Traeger Evita, they have um, one second is the medium, two seconds the minimum, maximum they recommend zero, and manufacturer recommends 0 0.2 seconds. Again, see all these numbers are, some of them go as percentage, some of them as the pressure slope, some of them actually say it in seconds or milliseconds. So 0.2 um, seconds is 20 milliseconds if we compare Hamilton to Drager. Again, I don't know why, somebody should regulate and tell these ventilator companies to display exactly the same unit for all ventilators. It'll be easier for us as clinicians. Okay, rice time, I want to put 20 milliseconds rather than one or two or three as a number. But unfortunately, that's how it works right now. Again, know your ventilator first. And flow cycling. So here is a baby. This is inspiratory flow ended, but the exhalation hasn't started because your inspiratory time is too long and the baby is trying to exhale. You see these beaks here on the pressure curve or you see like this, that means sorry, baby is trying to take, uh, your inspiratory time is too long. So once you adjust it, if you put a flow cycle, as soon as the baby's inspiration ends, baby can exhale, okay? You want to avoid active exhalation. That's why flow cycling is important. Um, slow rise to PIP, the slope setting on care fusion. If you set it at care fusion, Abia, I told you it's one to nine, right? This is setting at nine. Same patient, if you put rapid rise, the pressure goes up rapidly. See here, in, 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 increase rapidly and stays there, and then comes down, peak airway pressure and flow goes up, in, in, whereas here, if we have a slow rise time, flow increases slowly, pressure builds up slowly, and then maintain during lurid inspiratory time, and then pressure drops to peak. So slow rise time is the best way to manage babies. Don't put uh, rapid rise time or high rise time. It is again, uh, flow termination. So inspiratory flow, expiratory flow, uh, in, so before even the flow, expiratory flow came back to zero. Remember, ventilators after every breath will zero, back to zero, before it starts the next breath, the waveforms, okay? Every breath. So the flow did, expiratory flow did not come to zero. Inspiration started. You can see this. They usually have different colors. Inspiration, one color. Exhalation, one color. And then you can see. So complete exhalation with expiratory flow return into baseline. Here is expiratory flow, right? Expiratory came to zero, and then inspiration started. This is called the zero flow. No flow is going into the baby or out of the baby, okay? Here, the flow did not even come to zero. Inspiration started. So here is a slow return of expiratory flow. This is inspiratory flow, expiratory flow. Takes a long time. You know what that is. That is BPD baby, or baby's gas trapping. Um, it's usual, you know, these pressure volume curves uh, a lot of times at the bedside. This is your PEEP here. This is your PIP. This is the volume, pressure volume axis. This is inspiration. This is expiration. Inspiratory resistance is here. Expiratory resistance is always higher because when the baby is exhaling, airways become smaller, therefore resistance will be higher. So you, you always, uh, this is resistance during inspiration resin during expiration. So again, as I mentioned, neonatal ventilator graphics, they always read the reset to zero at the end of every breath for the volume, okay? It backs to zero volume and then goes up. Tidal volume, six ml per kilo, comes back zero, next breath. If the graphics did not reset, then they usually go off the screen. That's why they have to reset. So gas trapping, how do you know baby's gas trapping? I told you this is inspiratory flow up, expiratory flow. Expiratory flow did not even get out of the baby's lungs, inspiration started. That means that's gas trapping. 
So what can you do? You can decrease the rate or increase the exploratory time. Okay, so LO circles means failure of the exploratory flow limb to return to zero baseline. And therefore the gas get trapped in the lung and the baby can get hyperinflated, you increase the risk for pneumothorax and polytrauma. So if the baby needs intubation and invasive ventilation, begin with pressure assist control, TCPL or SAME VG, if we have VG mode. If you don't have VG mode, start with SAME. We recommend caffeine in preterm babies less than 250 grams uh, who are on mechanical ventilation. Consider the vitamin A if it's available in babies intubated and continue to be intubated by three days of age. If the baby got extubated within a day or two, then a lot of people are not using vitamin A because it has to be given subcutaneously and oftentimes is not available. Your goal is to extubate the baby as soon as possible. And of course, oxygen saturation targeting, we target 87 to 89 until the baby gets to 33 weeks and then we go to 91 to 94. But you can use whatever you are using in your unit. That's my, my recommendation. So here are some other guidelines, you know, how, what PIP do you set? Set 15 centimeters above PEEP, which means 20 over five, tidal volume five ml per kilo, typically rated 40, high time 0.45, flow cycle at five or 10%, PEEP maximum is about eight. If you're on pressure support, one third to one half of the delta pressure, or five to 10 centimeters above the peep. You can also look at what is baby generating spontaneous tidal volume. When you're on pressure support and on peep by the endotracheal tube, the tidal volume that machine is showing you is all generated by the baby. If that is about four to five ml, you know your pressure support is okay. If that is generating seven or eight ml per kilo, that means your pressure support is too much then you can decrease your pressure support value, okay? PPD, totally different management now. We use much larger tidal volume, 10 to 12 ml per kilo, long inspiratory time, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 seconds. Adjust the FiO2 to target saturation of 90 to 95. Allow higher PCO2, 65, even 70. Slow rate, remember slow rate allows better emptying of the lung and you're able to, especially you're delivering large tidal volume, right? So you want the baby to get that gas out. So 10 to 20 breaths per minute. So you cannot manage a baby with BPD like you would do a baby with RDS. So that's the important thing to consider. Complex role of PEEP, because the airway collapses. So they, sometimes you have to use a PEEP of seven, eight, nine, even 10. We rarely go more than 10, Although I rarely go more than even eight. I get worried about it. Um, change in rise, uh, rate, tidal volume, inspiratory, expiratory time, pressure support, or they're all related to each other, highly interdependent. So if you over distend the lung, baby may get agitated and paradoxically, it may worsen the ventilation. So you need to watch the baby. Again, in this, to prevent lung injury, you start low tidal volume, right? But to treat lung injury, establish lung injury, it's totally different. Large tidal volume, long inspiratory time, low rate in um, uh, low saturation. Okay, that's about, so I talked about volume guarantee and I talked about um, synchronized ventilation management of baby with RDS, management of baby with PPD. Uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about high-frequency ventilation. It's basically small tidal volume delivered at supra-physiological rate. If the baby's breathing rate is 40, if we deliver at 60, that's high frequency. So it's basically small tidal volume, but you also want to maintain optimal lung volume. That's the pro lung protective strategy. Again, each of the ventilators delivers high frequency ventilation differently. All our high frequency devices same? My answer is no. 
sensor medics, IE ratio can be one to two or one to one. We always use one to two, never use one to one. Okay, it's an electromagnetic generator. Uh, 3100B uh, is again uh, for bigger type adults. SLE 5000, it's a bi directional jet. Always IE ratio is one to one. You cannot change the IE ratio. Fabian is uses an active membrane. So IE ratio is one to two. Leoni plus. It's a membrane integrated diaphragm, so they use one to two. SOFI is a valve oscillator with active exhalation, just like sensor medics. So again, it's one to two if they recommend. Draeger is a venturi assisted expiration with an expiratory valve, one to two IE ratio. A BL8000 Draeger, very similar to VN500. So again, I don't know what the most common high frequency ventilator use in Romania. You better know your ventilator, see how it works, whether it's active exhalation or not, and then what is the recommended IE ratio. As I said, most of the time, use one to two, except SLE 5000. Uh, they recommend you can do one to one without increasing the risk of gas trapping. What are the evidence show? This is elective high frequency ventilation versus Controlled mechanical ventilation or SIMB. 10 randomized control trials, I believe, or more than that. And over, uh, sorry, over um, 3,000 patients. This is published in 10 years ago almost. Exactly, yeah, 10 years ago. Um, today, June. This is the conclusion high frequency oscillatory ventilation, that is from the beginning, from day one, a baby with RDS. There are very few people who believe in it and use high frequency ventilation from the beginning. Okay, but it's not, there is no data to support that. Equally effective to conventional mechanical ventilation in preterm babies, our results do not support selection of preterm babies for high frequency oscillatory ventilation, elective, okay, early primary use on the basis of gestation age, birth weight for gestation how bad the lung disease is, whether the mother got steroids or not. It's expensive. You really don't, you get the same results if you use condensed ventilator, SIMB mode. So don't use high frequency ventilation as a primary mode. If you have the money, if you have the ventilator and you want to use it, you can do it, but data doesn't support that. You can do as good as using SIMB mode. So if you are using high frequency ventilation, what frequency should I set it up? Babies less than one kilo, 15 hertz. One to two kilo, 12 to 15 hertz. Two to 12, 10 hertz. Bigger baby, lower hertz. Smaller the baby, higher the frequency. Older the baby, lower the frequency. For example, if you are using high frequency ventilator for a baby with BPD, you cannot use 10 hertz. You should use somewhere between six to seven hertz or even as low as five hertz. It's babies with BPD, failing condensed ventilation, bad gases, what do you do? You want to try high frequency ventilation, right? When you do that, try to use lower frequency. Older the baby, lower the frequency. Here is what, you know, if you're an oscillator, very simple machine, only two things to adjust, mean airway pressure or amplitude. We never adjust the IE ratio. So ventilation is primarily controlled by the amplitude. The PCO2 is high, increase the amplitude. If PCO2 is low, decrease the, or, or, or decrease the frequency. The PCO2 is low, either you decrease the amplitude or increase the frequency. Why? Because if the CO2 is low, by increasing the frequency, you actually reduce the tidal volume delivered. Sometimes this is another confusion, young doctors or doctors in training. Oh, if I decrease, increase the rate, my CO2 should uh, um, go down. But that's not the case because the area under the curve is going to be less. Okay, so remember that. CO2 is high, it's like opening up the, uh, your hands. Uh, either increase the amplitude up here or decrease the frequency. Oxygenation is primarily controlled by mean airway pressure and FiO2. 
So uh, is there a benefit of high frequency ventilation versus high frequency ventilation plus VG volume guarantee mode? Combining both these modes. Here's a small study uh, published, uh, and not, there are more studies that have been published. This is a study from Turkey where they looked at tidal volume. This is during high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Remember, these are all very small, okay? One to 2.5 ml per kilo because it's high frequency, right? They added volume guarantee. You get more consistent tidal volume with VG mode. They also looked at carbon dioxide diffusion coefficient, dCO2, which the ventilator displays. It calculates tidal volume square times frequency times ml per second, and then displays a value. That's called the uh, CO2 diffusion coefficient. In other words, there's very little changes in PCO2. You can see uh, very regular high frequency oscillation, a lot of babies ended up getting hypocarbia or hypercarbia. Here, pretty much the CO2 was staying around 40 to 45. So adding high frequency oscillation plus VG mode, if your ventilator does, is a good, another good way to do it. Okay, these are the guidelines for oscillation. Amplitude, 20 centimeters, or if the baby was on the condensed ventilator before the baby went to oscillator, whatever PIP the baby was on. If the baby was on a PIP of 30 on the condensed ventilator, and you want to switch the baby, I will start with 30 centimeters amplitude. Mean airway pressure, three or uh, above. The mean airway pressure on condensed ventilator. And we talked about hertz, 15 hertz. If baby is less than one kilo, one to two kilo, 10 hertz. I really don't even like 15. I generally use, recommend 12 kilos, 12 hertz, even in small babies. Inspiratory time, one third, which means one to two IE ratio. Again, flow rate even on high frequency ventilation, three times the size of the endotracheal tube. So that's basically what you want to adjust, right? Amplitude, mean airway pressure, and frequency. And IE ratio, I told you IE ratio is one to two. So only these things you need to know. Again, you don't change much the frequency, you only change the mean airway pressure. If you have trouble with oxygenation, but the lung is not well expanded, you increase the amplitude up or down. For each centimeter increase in amplitude, we expect the PCO2 to change by two to three tar. The PCO2 is 70, and you want to bring it down to 60. And the baby has the ventilator set at 30 amplitude, 30 centimeters. You go up to 33. So you will expect the CO2 to come down by about nine or 10 as a rule of thumb. For each amplitude, each centimeter change in amplitude, your PCO2 will change by two to three millimeters of mercury or tar. Again, uh, disease-specific strategies. Okay, baby has already has still SIME as a primary mode, assist control with VG. Uh, as I mentioned, high-frequency oscillatory ventilation only used as a secondary mode. If the baby meconium aspiration, ARDS, pneumonia, SAME or volume control with VG can be used, diaphragmatic hernia, SAME or AC, very little data on VG mode, PIE, air leaks, use oscillation, TPHN, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Again, as a primary mode, SAME is still good, unless the baby is going to go on nitric oxide and very high pressures, you may switch to oscillator. Uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, probably oscillation, high frequency ventilation, PPD, again, SIME, assist control, may use VG mode. Um, these are adjunctive treatments in addition to ventilator management, surfactant for RDS, ARDS, meconium aspiration, permissive hypercapnia, little bit lower saturation in babies, diaphragmatic hernia, again, PIE, air leaks, permissive hypercapnia, PPH and HRF, inhaled nitric oxide, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, you may use surfactant. The baby has a PDA, treat the PDA. Very rarely, you may have to use intratracheal epinephrine to stop the bleeding from the trachea and the lung. BPD, early evolving BPD, sometimes you may use surfactant. 
um, baby has pulmonary hypertension and BPD, you will use iona, inhale nitric oxide. Sildenafil is also used increasingly. And I'll talk about nitric oxide and other things tomorrow. So I think I have already mentioned this. Oh, nitric oxide is supposed to be today. Oops. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Uh, you want me to finish nitric oxide today or I can do it tomorrow? Let me... As you yeah. wish, Professor. Okay, I can. I have... Uh, okay, Professor, I have... Professor, maybe today. Okay, okay, I'll do it today, okay. Yeah. So I only have six slides. So nitric oxide, um, what are the indications? Either you can use it as a rescue mode for the treatment of acute pulmonary hypertension at the time right after birth in babies, in preterm babies. For example, a baby with sepsis, a baby born after oligohydramnias, lung hypoplasia can come up with severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, data on using for prevention of BPD and nitric oxide has not turned out to be useful, so nobody uses it now. Um, a baby who has severe pulmonary hypertension, again due to oligohydramnias or lung hypoplasia, people are using it. And sometimes when the baby is getting BPD and getting pulmonary hypertension, the nitric oxide is used. So basically, there are four indications. Out of that, two people are commonly using it. No one is now using it for routinely to prevent BPD. Uh, these three conditions are where people are using it. Acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in the micro preemie, or baby has pneumonia and pulmonary hypertension, you maximized and baby is not getting better, you can do that. Or baby has established BPD and has pulmonary hypertension, you may use nitric oxide. Uh, we wrote a, we ran a workshop uh, last year in Journal of Pediatrics, um, uh, all these experts, we joined together and wrote a review on nitric oxide. If you're interested, please review the paper. If not, I can send it to you, all of you. So what do people are doing? This is data from Vermont Oxford Network, most recent data uh, around the world, um, hundreds of NICUs. You can see inhaled nitric oxide is used in 22 weeks, 16% of the time. 18% of the babies at 23 weeks receive nitric oxide. So this is all off label, okay? not approved. You can see lots of NICUs around the world, in US, Europe, Israel, Europe, everywhere. People are using anywhere from you know, 4% to 20% of the babies or receiving nitric oxide. These are only preterm babies I'm talking about, less than 30 week gestation. A lot of babies are getting nitric oxide therapy. Here is a... Um, um, a report from uh, England, uh, a national data, all units in England, they reported, Subeda reported in the e European Academy of Pediatric Society May meeting in 2018. You can see 169 units, total number of units, now it's 161 units that he got the response, all were less than 29 weeks. Uh, nitric oxide use, 4.9% in 2011, 9.3% in 2013. Same NICUs. Now, 16% of the NICUs are using nitric oxide, all in babies less than 29 weeks. Between 29 to 33 weeks, 5% of the units are using it. So both in moderately preterm and severely preterm babies, nitric oxide is used. Interestingly, approved is of more than 34 weeks, okay? Nitric oxide use, 5%. That has been pretty steady. So most of the nitric oxide used today in England, NICUs is in this micro premise, okay? 5% in term uh, late preterm babies, moderately preterm babies, 5%, 15 or 16% of the nitric oxide used in the United Kingdom to, is in babies less than 29 weeks, all not approved. So they conclude, he concluded that use of nitric oxide increased between 2010 and 2015, especially in preterm babies in whom it's used outside the marketing authorization or off-label use. This is the first national report of INO use in neonates from Europe, mainly from England. 
So we looked at in the state of California, 216 babies in the Kaiser system, you can see uh, in six NICUs in this network, 40% of the babies that got nitric oxide were less than 34 weeks. And 72% of them were less than 29 weeks. So nitric oxide use is increasingly, people are using it increasingly in these micro preemies, mainly from lung hypoplasia, oligo from oligohydramnias and pulmonary hypertension. These babies have clear lungs, but severe PPHN. So these are the recommendations, okay? NICHD in summary in 2011, 2011 said, no evidence to support use of nitric oxide in early routine or early rescue or later rescue treatment in babies less than 35 weeks. However, they said in babies with PPHN or pulmonary hypoplasia, INO may be of benefit. Academy of Pediatrics 2014 said, results from randomized control trials show no survival benefit. So preponderance of evidence does not support nitric oxide. Okay? American Heart Association, American Thoracic Society in 2015 said, I know can be beneficial in preterm baby to severe hypoxemia due primarily to PPH and physiology rather than lung disease particularly if associated with prolonged preterm rupture of membranes and oligohydramnios. So the baby has RDS or pneumonia, they say it's not useful. Baby has clear lungs, no lung disease, but has PPHN, I know can be beneficial. Pediatric pulmonary hypertension network in 2016 said, I know can be beneficial in preterm with severe hypoxemia, due to PPN physiology, very similar to ATS recommendation or American Heart Association recommendation. I know is preferred for other pulmonary vasodilators for BPD prevention based on strong safety profile. So you have a preterm baby with BPD and you need is a pulmonary vasodilator, the pediatric pulmonary hypertension network recommends um, I know use. Cochrane review, 2017 said, well, there are no clear indications for INO use in preterm babies. I just showed you most of the NICUs in UK, Canada, I mean, in California, Vermont Oxford Network are still using nitric oxide in spite of the Cochrane Review report. So how do you assess the babies if you're going to use nitric oxide? I think the best thing is you must get the echocardiography. Try get try to 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 estimate the right ventricular systolic pressure. If pulmonary regurgitation is present, you can estimate the mean pulmonary artery pressure. If there is a pressure gradient across the PDA, that will help you to estimate right ventricle or pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Um, severe pan systolic flattening or posterior systolic bowing suggests the pulmonary pressure is systemic. Okay, just the flattened septum suggests at least pulmonary pressure is one half of the uh, systemic pressure, right ventricular pressure. So echocardiography is very useful um, in, if you are going to start a nitric oxide in preterm babies. Again, you have to pay more attention to left ventricular function also, and size are extremely important if you are going to nitric oxide and do not hurt the baby. LV dysfunction may result from high pulmonary artery pressure and extra pulmonary shunt. If you use nitric oxide, could increase the pulmonary blood flow. So more blood comes from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. And if the left ventricle, because of asphyxia, sepsis, myocardial dysfunction, then the left atrium gets enlarged, blood backs up, pulmonary edema due to LV dysfunction. So you should always suspect left ventricular dysfunction in a baby who has a right to left shunt at the PDA by echo, but echocardiography says, well, the shunt is right to left in PDA, but predominantly left to right at the atrial level. In that situation, you should consider using drugs like milrinone is more effective 
than using nitric oxide. So you have to be careful, even in a preterm baby with PPHN, just make sure when the ec you do the echo or cardiologist does the echo, look at two sites. What is the shunt at the PDA level? Second question, what is the shunt at the atrial level? The both are left to right, yeah, use nitric oxide. If one is left to right, for example, the atrial level, but right to left at the PDA level, then you need to help the left ventricle by using an afterload reducing agent like milrinone. He may get better even without nitric oxide. So we strongly recommend echocardiography before starting INO. I know many centers in Romania or even in here don't have that. If echo cannot be done, how do you diagnose pulmonary hypertension? If the PAO2 is very labile, saturation goes up and down, or a differential cyanosis pre and post difference of more than three to 5% in the presence of hypoxemic respiratory failure. My own recommendation is how, how should I start? I usually start at five parts per million. I'm talking about preterm babies. No response, I would increase the dose to 10 parts per million, maximum 20 parts per million. When the oxygen is index, is more than 20, 20 OI, or if you can calculate oxygen saturation index, which is basically uh, instruct, um, mean uh, F, uh, PAO2 use the saturation. Oxygen saturation is more than nine, we would consider nitric oxide, or OI more than 20. Preferable to switch to high frequency ventilation from SIMV before starting nitric oxide. This is again, this is my own recommendation. Some people say we may start everybody at 20 parts per million, preterm or term, where preterm babies get into more trouble if we start a high dose. Last slide, uh, because we are in a pandemic of COVID. So how do we resuscitate a baby born to a mother who is COVID positive mom? So one, you want to protect yourself, um, mom, gown, mask, gloves, and uh, eye protection with the face shield or goggles. Um, if you're going to intubate the baby or bag the baby, you want to use a filter, a viral filter. If you're attached to the ventilator on the inspiratory side, even for a bag and mask. Um, so these are the precautions you should take to protect yourself and the co-workers in the NICU, okay? Use a viral filter. Um, this is disposable and small dead space viral filters are available. So you put it between the bag and the mask or bag and ram cannula or teepees and, uh, and the mask, you put the viral filter. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and be happy to answer any questions.